ahead and start. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Barbara Sanford, and I am a US FSIP intern with the Office of International Visitors. I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's Faces of Exchange event with IVLP star alumna Magda Budager Karat from Lebanon. In 2020, the US, US State Department celebrated 80 years of the International Visitor Leadership Program by highlighting 80 impressive alumni of the program our Faces of Exchange. The Faces of Exchange virtual programs were so successful that we are continuing them in 2021 to build more connections across the globe through Zoom. Since 1940, the IVLP has welcomed nearly a quarter of a million emerging leaders from 160 countries to travel throughout the United States to look, learn, listen, and share. They meet with professional counterparts such as government officials, scientists, journalists, academics, and civil society members, and a diversity of wonderful Americans such as many of you here today, all in an effort to build their professional networks and to develop firsthand knowledge of this country. Those of you who have met with international visitors, either in an office or over the dinner table, thank you for the important work you do in promoting cultural diplomacy one handshake at a time. Again, wherever you are in the world, thank you for coming to our Faces of Exchange conversation as one of our star alumni shares with us her life, her leadership, and the impact her exchange experience in the United States has had on the global community. Now I'd like to take a moment to cover the rules of the road for this Zoom conversation. So as you know, we are all joining via Zoom today. We would appreciate if you um, could remain muted um, this way, we can make sure that everyone can adequately hear Magda and get the most out of the presentation. Also, to conserve bandwidth, please use the video only um, at the end of the session if, that, if you're having issues with your internet connection. However, you are also welcome to join video on as long as you can stay connected. This session will be recorded and shared on YouTube Live. Um, a notice should have come up so that you are aware of that. Um, and that means that we will be able to distribute this video after the call um, so that you can share with others or, or those of you who are here today can watch later. Um, you can send a chat to the host or the co-host if you're having any technical issues. And most importantly, we are using slido.com today for this connection. So if you haven't had the chance yet, um, please access our slido.com. Um, you can either scan this QR code to join or go to slido.com and enter hashtag Magda as the code. So once you're on Slido, you can do a few different things. You can enter some questions of your own when you come up with questions during the presentation. You can also upvote questions that you're interested in to ensure that they get asked. So we'll monitor Slido and ask questions based on um, the questions that are requested and the questions that are upvoted. So we highly encourage you to stay active on Slido as well. So the other tab on Slido is the polls tab. So once you're on slido.com, you should see Q&A and polls. Um, and we're gonna begin by using the poll tab right now. So if you would like to click on that tab and answer our question of the day, which is in one word, what is the biggest challenge facing women in conservation? So I'll give you a few minutes to add some answers and then maybe we can see which ones pop up on the board. Um, if, you, if multiple people vote for the same question, same answer, um, it'll also get larger so we can see the distribution of answers. Wow, climate change is getting a lot of attention in our poll. Opportunities, funding, another funding answer, limiting expectations, opportunities. I'll just give this one more minute. 
sexism, being vocal. family commitments, structural sexism. Yeah, these are really great answers. Um, I like that we're seeing both funding and climate change blow up. We're seeing one that's more of a direct issue that people are confronting with their work and another that they may face in the process of doing so. So I think these are wonderful answers. Thank you for participating and feel free to continue adding answers if you like. Um, and now we're gonna continue to the next portion of the event. Eight years ago at Dulles Airport, I met a group of six women from the Middle East and North Africa arriving for a three week international visitor leadership program on women's innovations in science and engineering. We visited Washington DC, Philadelphia, San Francisco and Minneapolis. This group turned out to be one of my favorite groups in the 11 years that I have been involved with the IVLP. Today's speaker is one of those amazing women and I'm thrilled to introduce her to you today. And I see at least two other women from that amazing group joining us today as well. Magda Bou Daguerre Karat is an important figure in Lebanese environmental conservation circles. Magda began her environmental career at St. Joseph University of Beirut in 2001, co-founded a nonprofit organization focusing on reforestation. She received the UNESCO L'Oreal for Women in Science Award for her work in the conservation of native Lebanese flora. She also received the Order of Academic Palms from the French Republic for her valuable service to universities, education, and science. And she was named an outstanding woman scientist in the Women of Science Hall of Fame in 20, 2011 to 2012 through a program of US embassies and consulates in the Middle East and North Africa. She's a plant geneticist working on understanding the evolutionary process of tree populations and flowering plants to help in biodiversity conservation efforts. Magda has also become a strong advocate for international exchange programs to build global connections. Prior to her IVLP experience, when Magda was looking for international collaboration, she would have looked in Europe since that was her orientation. However, the contacts she made during her IVLP encouraged her to look for resources all over. As a result, she's been working with the Smithsonian Institution on ancient and environmental DNA for DNA barcoding and metabarcoding. And don't worry, she'll explain all this to you. <laughs> Another connection she made was when she visited the National Geographic headquarters in Washington, DC to see how they bring science to the world through their interactive programming. As a result of that visit, she's currently a Nat Geo Explorer. When she was here as an IV, a speaker at an NIH meeting mentioned a re-entry program aimed at helping women go back to school to get their degrees after they had taken time off to raise a family. When she returned home, she did this unofficially for several women with plans to start a more formal program in the future. I know you will enjoy learning more directly from our speaker. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Magda. Thank you, Lisa, for your nice words. Thank you for this introduction. And thank you everybody for hosting me for IVLP program. I was really very, very happy to, I feel privileged to, to be selected for this program and uh, to dedicate time for me to, to explain my work and how IVLP impacted, impacted my life and, and my career. So uh, I think I was granted access to the screen. Thank you. So yeah, I will, um, I will summarize a little bit what I'm doing now, but I would like to just um, say a few words about uh, how I felt when I was selected for IVLP in 2013. I don't know if I shared with this with you, Lisa and Colin, but I remember when I got all my files and visa and everything, it was like in March and you are going in, in April. And I remember that I declined all my invitation to go skiing or any activity with risk just to be sure that I will be really fine and healthy to go and, and profit from this, uh, from this trip. And it was really something very memorable. And uh, I was really very, very happy and grateful for, for this opportunity. And I hope it will be uh, the case for uh, all the, the women you select for this program. 
So back to uh, my presentation, my actual activity revolved um, on three different axes. Uh, biodiversity exploration, and then ecosystem restoration or in situ conservation. I think I should. Okay. Just a minute. Okay. So it's taking time to move. I should just. Well. So for the first act for biodiversity exploration, uh, I mainly uh, tackle species inventories with special interest uh, for endemic species. Knowing with whom we are sharing our planets is very important. And it's a prerequisite to every protection uh, strategy we want to, to apply. So we created national database to share with the world the richness of our biodiversity. One for plants, one for fauna, and one for fungi. And we are collaborating today with two major uh, inventories for biodiversity on our planet, the International Barcode of Life and the Life Plan Project, where we have, uh, so Lebanon is one point of uh, inventories for biodiversity at local, and we are joining this global effort to, uh, to document biodiversity. Then, uh, in order to be able to confirm the uniqueness of our plants or, or our animals, uh, we study their DNA and we compare this DNA to the DNA of other species in the region. And we, we show that these are the, the Lebanese plants, for example. And uh, so we call this DNA barcoding or uh, molecular characterization. We work on their chromosomes, etc. And the third point under biodiversity exploration is the phylogeography and phylogenetic studies. So I'm not uh, give you complicated words, just to say that given the geographical position of Lebanon at the east of the Mediterranean on a crossroad between Africa and, uh, and Eurasia, and given the complex topography of Lebanon, we have a lot of species very, very, I don't say weird, but they had always something special. When we, when we study biodiversity at a global scale for Africa, for example, or for Europe, whenever we include Lebanese samples for animals or for plants, they always have something interesting to say. They are even hybrid between these two groups, or they are a very old species from which speciation um, or new species uh, arose. And then for the second act, the Ecosystem Restoration Act. Um, so here we are working on uh, three, three themes. So under Jusur Lubnan flag, Jusur Lubnan is an NGO I co-founded in 2008, which means Lebanon roots in, uh, in, uh, in Lebanese. And uh, the, with this NGO, in fact, uh, we were the first to promote the use of native trees and especially of different tree species to be able to create again the lost ecosystems, the lost forest ecosystems. In fact, uh, since the native trees, we wanted to plant. So, okay, we planted cedars, we planted pine. These are the, the, the main trees we can find in, in nurseries. But if we want to create a forest, or to restore the old forest, these forests are very diversified, as I was saying. So we have to include more trees, more trees from different types, mainly uh, wild fruit trees, like wild apple, wild pear, or, or something else. So we wanted to plant these, uh, these trees, but we couldn't find them in the nurseries. That's why we created in the Faculty of Science and Joseph University, uh, a lab, a special lab, where we can germinate this kind of seeds and share the protocol of germination with nurseries, with local nurseries, from whom we will purchase later on the trees to be planted. And this is something very, very innovative at, uh, since back 2009, and we are still working uh, with this lab. The third point, and this one was really uh, very interesting. So. You remember I said that we will plant these different trees. Okay, so we planted cedars and we plant all these wild, uh, wild fruit trees. If we want that these forests that we are planting today will be 
sustainable in the future and will regenerate naturally. We don't have to plant them again another time in 60 or 80 years. So we have to be sure that they will sustain themselves. And for these plants, for example, for these wild trees, we know that animals are responsible of dispersing their seeds. So if the animals are not here, we have to replant again. So we wanted to be sure that animals are here and they are doing their job. And here we have the option of capturing animals or putting photograph to, uh, like video traps to see if animals are here. Or do something else as a non-invasive technique, very intelligent technique and very uh, smart, which is to work on a formidable, um, richest treasure, I call it, scats or droppings. So these droppings that animals leave in, in the environment are full of information. So we will go and collect these cats, as you see in this picture, and then back to the lab, we'll isolate the DNA. So the DNA will tell us which animal dropped it and what did he eat all the time before. And all of this is based on DNA. We call it environmental DNA because it's not fresh DNA, it's just DNA left in the environment. And for this purpose, uh, and when I wanted to do this, I just sent an email for an American colleague from the Smithsonian Institute and get a reply a few hours later. And he told me, yes, of course you can come and you can, uh, you can learn about it. So I called the uh, US embassy in Lebanon and told them I have this project. And they were really very responsive. They told me to write a small uh, proposal and I get a small grant to cover my travel to uh, to uh, to Washington, and when I go, the, I, I was there. It was really fantastic. I learned this uh, technology, which was more cons uh, constraining than just isolating DNA in the normal lab. We have some special measures to um, to do. And then I came back to Lebanon. I did it in my lab. I teach it to my, my students. And then we launched a PhD program, PhD um, project. One of my students go back to the US and completed also the work. So it was in 2016. And now in 2021, we have like four or five scientific papers already published. And we have a lot of information about which animals are still present in Lebanon? All of that you can see in this picture. Okay, you can leave alone the cow and uh, uh, the cow and goat, but all the others are wild species and they are helping in dispersing seeds. But other than the seeds, also we know what they eat all year long and how they sustain themselves when the seeds are not here. So these are really very important information for ecological restoration and. They indicate how, um, what are, if we want to help this environment and we want to help this forest, we should be taking care of all this community of plants and animals. And these are very novel information, important not just for Lebanon, but for all the region, all the Mediterranean region with whom we share a lot of species. The third point and the third um, uh, theme is in situ conservation or what we call it conservation on site in situ means on site in in latin so um, here we have also the framework of this um, of uh, a fund that we got from the critical ecosystem partnership fund who are funding a project to protect biodiversity on the hotspot for biodiversity and mediterranean region is one of these hotspots where we have a very rich biodiversity and this biodiversity is threatened by mainly by human activities. So we were here also innovative by creating two types, by applying or creating types of protection adapted to what we are living. The first one uh, was the creation of what we call micro reserve. You know, to create a natural reserve or a protected area, it's a very long process to see for whom belongs the land, if it's a private or if it's a communal or, uh, or it's for the state, you have to apply for different papers. And sometimes it, it gets so long that the plants or the animal will disappear just before we get along with this uh, administrative work. By adopting this micro reserve project or micro reserve approach, we are protecting small patches of, of place, of, um, of land, and we have two successful examples, for example, 
and both of them were to protect irises. One was in image region, which it was a communal land, and the other one, one was for religious community. And so we, we went to the community, we explained why these plants are important, why they are threatened, and how responsible they, they are because they have this treasure on their land. And they were really very responsive, and we get to create very quickly these, uh, these small protected areas. The second one, second part was, um, which is now uh, highlighted by my National Geo uh, grant, was to protect this kind of, um, of national treasures, endemic plants, not by creating a new protected area, but just to be, to, to profit from the existence of already protected area. And you know, Lebanon is full of archeological sites. And the Directorate General of Antiquities in Lebanon are very firm. So when they protect, they are really protecting things. And we thought, why not including our plants, the things that you want to protect in this already protected area? And in this case, we can also promote our cultural heritage and our natural heritage. You know, these plants I'm talking about are in Lebanon on the land that we call today Lebanon since millions of years, even before Lebanese were there or before the Lebanese passport exists already. So by showing to people who are tourists or whoever come and visit this archeological site, you will explain that also these are special for the region. You will not find them anywhere else. Um, so yeah, this is what we call it circum city conservation. So we will harvest seeds in the wild from the uh, threatened population. We will germinate them in the lab and we will plant them inside the archeological site. Of course, these plants are not invasive and are not destroying the archeological site. This is the first uh, condition of our colleagues archeology, archeolo working on archeology. span So well, as this is my, um, uh, so for my National Geo grant, I'm studying the genetics of these iris in order to be sure that we are not in, in introducing clones and we have enough genetic diversity to sustain this population for the future. And I invite you, I think uh, we will put uh, this YouTube links in the chat where we can see two short video about this uh, introduction of plants in archaeological sites that we prepared this year and I really like them. And with this, I will just um, tell you that all what I explained for sure is not my own work. I'm not just uh, one person. I'm really uh, working with a, an extraordinary team. Some of them are already doctors, PhDs, and working uh, somewhere else, but, uh, and others are just doing some training now. But everybody bring his, um, I don't know how we say it in English, but bring a, a nice big load to this huge work of conservation in, in Lebanon. So I would like to thank them all. Voila, this is what I had to say for you today. Anta, thank you so much for your presentation. I know that I speak on behalf of everyone here that we're so grateful for you to share your stories with us and to share the incredible impact of your work. So thank you so much for joining us and for sharing. Um, for everyone else who's here, this is a perfect time to think about what questions you have based on the presentation and share them on Slido. Um, so we'll move into the Q&A section next. Um, and just to make sure that you get heard, make sure to go upvote the, the questions that you're most interested in and add your own. Um, so I'll give you just a moment to do that and then we'll begin the Q&A. Barbara, I'm getting questions in, uh, in Slido. Can I, you will read them or I reply yes. directly? What do you prefer? I'm happy to read those out and um, you can answer. That way you don't have to um, be yeah. trying to manage Slido and speak at the same time. Yeah. All right. So we will get started. One of our early questions that we received, um, someone was asking if you faced any difficulties as a female geneticist. Um, I think this is just every um, working woman. It's not about science or not science, but just being uh, to have to take care about home, kids, personal life and work. And this is where uh, we have to count on our community, on our family 
uh, this was one of my biggest challenge. I tried to be a nice mom, a present mom, and at the same time be very professional and have a career. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned this issue of community and someone else from our audience today was asking if you've tried in any of your work to engage members of your community with conservation. I know that you have this outreach through videos and, and things like this, but have you tried to directly integrate the community members into your work, such as the plantation campaigns? Yeah, of course. I think I can uh, speak about two different things. Concerning the plantation, uh, as Yuzur Lubnan, we always have this idea about one of our objectives is to engage the local community because you know we plant and we go but they are the people who are every day on the ground and they have to feel the belonging and the responsibility of taking care of this and we engage them every time for planting for irrigating for taking care about the site and without them we cannot go further in this kind of project and we have people working with us on some sites since 10 years or 12 years so these are crucial people from the community on whom we should and we can count in order to have successful project on the other uh, part for conservation project here also when we create um, when we create uh, new protected areas uh, these areas should be and um, are used by communities, by schools, by teachers, because they have also this kind of, they feel the ownership, okay? This is for in my village, it's my protected area, and school can go there and explore and also explain to other visitors. And when we do training for a touristic guide or for ecotouristic guide, also we work on this point they are from the community and they present what they have as a local treasures. So yeah, community is key word in this. Thank you so much. I love, I love hearing what you have to say about building connection and investment in, in your local resources and local beauty. Um, that's so important. So we had someone ask specifically which animal and plant species are currently at risk of extinction or particularly susceptible um, to this type of ecological damage. If you'd like to share some specific examples of plants or animals that you've been targeting with your work. Uh, for the plants, uh, for the plants, I, um, of course there are irises, but these are very charismatic and beautiful plants. Just one second. Lou, just I have to connect my computer because I'm losing energy. So I forget to put my chat. Take your time. This is a great time for everyone. If you haven't had the chance to go back on Slido and add some questions, uh, this is a perfect time to do so. Um, I'm loving seeing all the questions coming in and thank you for your active engagement in today's session. Um, it's also worth noting that we have just so much um, gratitude and excitement about Mag Magda's work. So Magda, lots of the comments coming in on Slido are admiring your passion, hard work, and congratulating you on your journey. So we really appreciate those comments as well. Everyone. And here you discovered all my display for having a nice light. <laughs> Sorry for this. Okay, so are we were, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So we were talking about um, um, the, the species that are threatened um, directly. So I was talking that irises are one of these species, but this one, we can see them because they are beautiful, they are charismatic, but a lot of other species, especially on coastal area or on high altitude area on mountains are, uh, are threatened uh, by urbanization or, uh, in fact, the main problem uh, um, of biodiversity in Lebanon is over uh, the humans. We are too many humans, demographic, explosion in Lebanon you have like already we were too many on this small territory and we have now two millions uh, visitors so I think it's uh, all biodiversity is under threat and all, all wild ecosystem are under threat animals particularly birds large mammals like hyena who have who suffer also the bad reputation of being a nasty animal while it's not. So we have a list and we are following uh, International Union for Nature Conservation, the IUCN Red List, uh, 
to put some criteria on um, to not being subjective about what we feel towards this animal if they are threatened or not. So we apply this kind of criteria and we say objectively which one are the most endangered and uh, and have to be saved. And there is a lot of them in this list. Thank you so much. Um, we had another specific question on the same track asking about plant invasion. Um, from what you're sharing, you're also seeming to talk about um, humans in their invasive role and the exploding population. But um, we're wondering more specifically about non-native plants and how this affects your work. Um, and then after that, we're going to pivot to some questions about your IVLP experience. Yeah, like many different countries today with the globalization, we have a lot of plants that are coming or animals coming from elsewhere and settling in, uh, in our place. And we have one example, a special example on uh, a plant coming from the US, from the west coast of the US. It was introduced in, um, uh, in the southern part of, uh, of Lebanon on coast to stabilize dunes. Uh, it was in the 70s and seeds arrived to Lebanon like in early 80s. And it became a very invasive. So it, uh, its name is uh, Eterotecta subaxillaris. You can see it in the film, one of the film I, I showed you. So it's a nice plant like uh, the other Asteraceae but it's, it was very invasive and it invaded a nature reserve, a coastal nature reserve. And here also we could, uh, we counted on uh, uh, an American colleague who visited Lebanon through farmer to farmer program. Uh, and she helped us to work on this invasive species. And uh, so this is one more example to say how this kind of collaboration and opening to the world can bring some special specialist experts and, uh, and help curing a problem. And yeah, we tried to uh, to pull it out, and we studied how what is the best way to do it, and uh, and we did it, and it's under control now. But it's also one example. There's a lot of other examples of invasive species species present in in Lebanon. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your work. Um, and now we'd love to take a moment to pivot over to your IVLP experience and talk about that for a while. Uh, we had one question coming in asking. Um, since you've traveled to the U.S. several times since your IVLP, we're wondering how you initiated some of those relationships during your IVLP program such that you could continue them after um, and return to the U.S. for more productive work. Now, in fact, in, uh, during the IVLP journey, everyone is so, it's like a new wonder world. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if really people, I was, I was thinking, are people really Americans are like this? And everyone is keen to help, to work, we have to, to collaborate. And really, they were very open. Uh, I, I know that Lisa and, uh, and uh, Anastasia and all the people who prepared this are, they picked up a very nice place to take us and very nice people to, uh, to communicate with. But it was like, yes, it was like a, a selective thing. They, pre they presented us interesting people, interesting opportunities, and all what we had to do is just to pick and keep contact. So I had a list after my, I left my, my visit. I have a few, a few pages of names and everyone doing what. And I asked myself, what is the better, best thing to do now? And I put priorities. And I kept keeping this person in the loop. I sent messages, I sent emails to thank them. And I launched some projects. And some of them were just keeping uh, saying uh, Happy New Year and or keeping in social media. And then after five years, do you remember me? I was there in 2013. And yeah, it was like a first, first step. But uh, of course, I did it um, with my IVLP contact, but also with people that were not on my IVLP contact, but they were, I was. Um, push to do it because I know now that it's a favorable um, atmosphere or how to tackle this. So they gave you also the key, how to prepare and how to approach these people. You know, if you know, you don't know people and you don't know the system, how it works, you, you will have difficulties to, to enter or to approach them. While during the IVLP, they broke this, okay, this is another world. No, they are nice and they are keen to, to collaborate. So just send your email. That's wonderful to hear. I'm so glad that so many fruitful connections came up out of your IVLP experience 
And everything you're saying is so important for our session today because this is a connection session. And we also want everyone to feel like when they're leaving this se session, they've also made potential connections. So if you're interested, at the end of the session, we will have Magda's contact information up on the screen. And we encourage you to continue building these connections um, through the IVLP program. So continuing on under the thread of your IVLP, I'm wondering if there's a certain moment that's particularly memorable from your IVLP experience and why it has stuck with you so much. I can say about two moments. Uh, the first one when I hugged a sequoia tree. So it was like, I felt that um, I'm doing a bad thing for my cedars because I was like, uh, I was working on cedars all the time and this was my famous tree and my my country tree and then I, I found myself hugging a sequoia tree it was like I'm doing something wrong but then I thought okay why do I have to work just locally just on cedars maybe I can work on other trees and this is when I I launched a new project on juniper tree these trees are much more present on on the planet. And uh, here we collaborated with our colleagues from uh, um, his name is Robert Adams. And he was like the expert of junipers in the world. And he was also an American counterpart colleague and I contacted him and we launched a study for all juniper of the world. And he has visited all, almost all the juniper in the world. So we, we, he granted us access to his collection and we worked on the juniper of all the world and you have a PhD student on this. So it's like this moment that when I was asking myself why I have to limit myself to work just on Lebanese trees. And this was like a moment to, uh, to switch and to, to open my eyes and to unfold my wings and work um, in a wider scale. And the other moment was at Stanford when uh, people were talking about uh, personal life and how we can um, manage to equilibrate professional life and uh, personal life. And it's something very important to me. Wonderful, that sounds like such an incredible, some incredible memories were made. Um, I see someone in the chat, uh, Rayan is commenting that uh, she remembers the day when you hugged the tree. So this is an impactful moment, not just for you, but for um, other people on your programs. That's wonderful. Um, I also wanna highlight a wonderful comment from Colleen saying, Magda was one of the most conscientious note takers and collected everyone's business cards. Networking is one of the most important aspects of IVLP. So it sounds like you really had the skills to make the most of your experience. And that's wonderful to hear. Um, I'm wondering if there are any other lessons that you took away from your IVLP experience or skills that you built um, that were valuable both during and after um, coming to the US on your IVLP. Yeah. In fact, I, um, as you noticed, maybe my English accent is not perfect. So I'm French educated and I was like, not very keen to speak in public. And uh, Lisa told me one day and I, Every time I struggle with my English, I remember if you make some yourself understandable, it's okay. Language is a tool. You have just to use it. And it's something that unlocked me. And even if I make some mistakes, when it's something written, I get my sister or my colleagues correcting my, my text. But when I'm talking, I think that just having my hands around can help people understand what I'm saying. So it was a, a key moment to say that English is not a barrier you can make yourself understandable, just uh, speak. So this was the first point. And the other one um, was concerning to not be afraid to go and knock on, on doors and say, okay, I have this. The worst case that happens is that you get a, a refute. No, I'm not interested. But in almost all the cases, you have a positive response and it's a new journey and a new interesting adventure. Wonderful. I completely agree with Lisa's comment in the chat that your English is fantastic. Um, thank you again for um, joining us today and being willing to share everything with us. Um, for one more comment on IVLP, we had a question about if there's anything that surprised you during your IVLP. This could be about 
your observations of life in the United States, um, specific meetings that you had, or anything that just in general surprised you and maybe changed your perception of an issue you were working on? Uh, I remember being, uh, I was, I heard about Quakers for the first time. So it's like some, uh, something, it was something new for me. Um, I cannot recall something weird. I really was what I keep after, um, after this is just like the feeling of how the society is structured and volunteering. This is something that I, I never saw in that scale, neither in Europe or in, uh, in the Middle East. So volunteering, we had volunteers everywhere in the museums in, uh, uh, in, in societies. So people like young people and also older ones, they are volunteers from their time, their expertise and something really a huge potential. And it should be, it's, uh, it's something that help people to feel um, to feel useful, even if they're not working for money, but at least they can offer their expertise. And at the same time, they are not alone. They can see new people, they, they gain uh, experience. So I think this volunteering thing, it's the most impressive things I, I learned from my, my journey. Wonderful, yeah, that's a really important observation. We actually had a question um, where someone was asking about how to create this sense of ownership and urgency in Lebanon surrounding the issue of conservation. They're saying this, this quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and so from your observations of volunteerism in the US, how do you think we can work towards creating a culture where people are really engaged with conservation work in their home communities in Lebanon? The first thing is I have to, to know I think either uh, as Lebanese, we have this very um, close relationship with our land and we have this structure of community. We, are, we have more than 18 different religious community. So uh, sometimes you just have to say the family name of a person to know directly its phylogeographic tree. So we have this um, love of dividing things and belong to which place in Lebanon. So we worked on this and we can also rely on this. When showing to people that this flower or this animal is in your land, in your country. So we have just to explain how rare it is, how wonderful. You know, each plant or each animal have something to say. Their mode of adaptation, mode of evolution, anatomically or physiologically, they are not all scientists, I agree. But if science can just put simple words to describe how this animal, for example, can change color just by moving on a given uh, environment, just by explaining this and what is the science behind it, with using simple words, just the next time he will look to it, he will see it differently. So we have to show them that and what I call it more, I call it a plant blindness or biodiversity blindness. So people can see, for example, plants are like just a decor or, or a background. So if they do this exercise by uh, erasing from their photographs, every single plant they see, first of all, they will see how many different plants they have on the background and how, how faint is the background without these plants. So this is a plant blindness. If we get, we, we, we succeed to show them each plant has a name and has an evolution history and have something special to arrive today. She, she goes through all the evolution and it's here today, how, how it's made it. And when you explain it, people, they will see it next time differently. So by communicating, by explaining this kind of things, I think we can change people behavior and people, um, um, people feeling towards this organism. Absolutely. So pivoting away from community engagement and looking more at some of the other challenges you face in this process, um, we're wondering about if there's any challenges you faced um, with engaging with authorities or exi existing structures in Lebanon that may um, put challenges on your work. I loved hearing about the way that you combined archeological preservation with um, 
biological preservation, which seems like a great way to kind of use the structures that already exist rather than being hampered by them. Um, but someone was asking if there are any challenges you've faced with working with the authorities in this work. Uh, challenging can, challenges can be at the time level, because you know, administration like everywhere uh, is very slow. So you have to go through a process, you cannot just, and uh, I'm known to be like a, a free electron. So I have my things and I have it done today, now and in my bubble. While in this kind of things, you have to take these all administrative steps to, to have things done under the umbrella of the government. I'm not creating a, a protected area for me or for my neighbor. It's a Lebanese national protected area. So we have to go through all these steps. And this is the biggest challenge is to be patient and to be uh, politically pushy in a nice way, not uh, to be ejected uh, outside the system. So you have to make this, uh, this effort to go this, through these administrative steps and to find the key person who can advance uh, your file and to get it signed and approved in, in the lifetime of the project. Yeah, that timing is always one of those challenges that are pretty unavoidable. Um, but thank you so much for, um, for everything you've shared. And we're wondering what you'd like to see happen next in Lebanon's conservation field. And specifically, what are the next steps of your own work looking forward? Okay, first of all, we should have some practical uh, problem solved, such as electricity and fuel and kind of very basic things. Uh, for biodiversity level, I think, it's very difficult, you know, because we are dealing with a human crisis, with some um, very basic problem for life. So it's somehow also difficult to, to, see, to say to people, don't cut trees when they don't have an alternative to heat their houses and have their kids a warm place to, to, to sleep or to stay. So, um, so NGOs in Lebanon are really uh, very active and involved and helping. But at some point, we cannot replace the government. We cannot, we cannot do what the government should do. We cannot buy fuel and bring it to Lebanon. You know? So there is, uh, we, we are dealing today at this time, we are just helping to cure the symptoms. But if we want to conserve biodiversity at the long run, we have to have the state role where you have to, to take measures and have regulation and get this regulation implemented in order to, to help biodiversity. Meanwhile, we are preparing everything. We are listing the species, we are listing the places to, to protect. And I hope that we can have this action done on time before it's too late. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you highlighting this conflict of having both human problems and, and this continuing interest in preserving biodiversity um, in your work. Thank you. Um, if there's anyone else who has a burning question that they would really like to get answered, again, you can turn to Slido. Otherwise, I think we may wrap this Q&A session up with one final question. Um, which is, thank you for your talk. Did you have home hospitality when you stayed in the US during your IVLP? Did you stay at someone's house or have the opportunity to interact with a lot of community members in the US? And did that help you understand anything about the US or your IVLP topic? Yeah, we had, uh, I, if I remember well, one, one dinner, uh, one hospitality, and uh, these people were really, really great. And uh, they were trying to make their best in order to, to arrange for us uh, a nice dinner with something that pleases us to, to eat. And um, I, was, uh, I was touched by their attention. They really wanted us to, to, to see the, the best thing of the US, of the hospitality. But at the same time, they were really very simple, very authentic, and uh, and I, pre I appreciate how they uh, they received us in their home. And uh, for a few hours, we were discussing every single 
uh, detail of an American uh, citizen. So it was like a very nice thing to keep in the program. And um, yeah, it's uh, at, at a human level, it's very rich. It should be kept. I'm so glad to hear that you had that experience. Um, thank you so much. So I think as, as we can tell by this presentation, these amazing connections made from IVLP um, continue after the program. And that's, as we said, exactly why we're here today. Um, if we could have the presentation back up on the screen, it, I think this now would be a good time to share Magda's contact information. If anyone is interested in getting connected um, or reaching out with further questions, uh, make sure to take note of these details. So we'll give you a moment to, to do that. Um, and again, on, every, on the behalf of the whole group, thank you so much for your thorough answers and the, all of the thought and the insight that you've shared with us today. Um, we just really appreciate you giving such detailed insight into the work you do, uh, which is so important and has such high impact on Lebanon. Thank you, everyone. I'll take time to read your question or comments in the chat. I hope I can see everybody. I'll put it on. Uh... So yeah, don't, please don't hesitate to contact me and if you want to know more about our work or if you want to contribute or to adopt a CEDAR, for example. Ryan, I'm sorry. And then when we're ready, um, Ava, if you'd like to transition into doing a group photo um, and these other wrap up items, um, feel free to take over and, and do that when you'd like. Thank you, Barbara. All right, so for everyone who is interested in taking a group photo, please turn on your cameras at this time. Just one moment. I'll wait one more minute before taking the photo because I see that some people are still turning on their cameras. Awesome. I see we have a lot of people. All right, great. I'm going to take the photo. So everybody on three, one, two, three. All right, we're gonna take one more just to make sure. So just one second, let me remove 